distinct pleasure to introduce my colleague, Ashley McDonald, who is our speaker today. And she is a research scientist here with me at the Nature Coast Biological Station. She works uh, with all of us here at the, in the team. And she's from Florence, Alabama, and she did her undergraduate degree in marine biology at the University of North Alabama. And then she went on to do her dissertation on seagrass ecology at Dolphin Island Sea Lab and University of South Alabama. And then she went to the Gulf Coast Research Lab in Ocean Springs, Mississippi for a Gulf Menhaden Fisheries Project. And that was before she came here to work on turtle grass ecosystem research with NCBS with former faculty member, Dr. Charlie Martin. And so she's been here at NCBS for five years and she works on a variety of topics that relate to estuarine ecosystem health. So fully marine seagrass habitats, all the way up to freshwater and springs environments, which I think we'll hear a little bit about today. So thank you so much for being here, Ashley. And I will stop sharing and hand the floor to you. Here, okay. All right, uh, yeah, thanks so much for that um, introduction, Savannah. Um, and thanks so much to you and Laura for hosting me today. And thanks to everybody for coming to hear my talk on uh, range expanded common snook. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, it sounded like your intro had a lot of seagrass ecology work. So now you're doing a talk about fish, like who was in charge of hiring on that day to bring a seagrass person in to uh, do this um, fish project. But um, one of the things, one of the reasons that I really um, came to love this project and have been working on it for several years now and will continue to do so for a little while longer is that um, it's not just a... Uh, a fish centered project. You know, it is very much about the biology of a specific fish species, but it's also about um, the habitat and also what environmental uh, features and fluctuations and changes, um, how they go in to affect that habitat. Um, and it's especially unique because it's habitat for a, um, a novel native species, one that has never, you know, until recently really spent um, year round time here in the Suwannee River estuary, Suwannee River Sound area. So it's just a very unique project and um, I'm very excited to talk to you all about it today. And um, so I also wanted to start by um, acknowledging that this work is the product of a great collaborative group that includes myself and other uh, researchers at NCBS. And um, but I also had help with FWC, um, their um, fisheries independent monitoring group um, at, out of Cedar Key. They've been a huge um, essential part of this product, this project and our partners in this project. And we were also getting funding and are collaborating with the Suwannee River um, Water Management District. And um, it's because of them we've been able to do all of this work. So they're a huge part of this research. And um, but basically, my presentation today is on the current iteration of an ongoing investigation looking at the habitat use of this recently range expanded sport fish species that is normally typically native to South Florida and the Caribbean, but only recently began spending its time year round in the Suwannee River Basin and is what we're calling a novel native species. So um, basically to start, I need to kind of provide some uh, background on common snook and a little bit of context for that uh, recent range expansion into the Suwannee estuary. So get ready for some facts of snook life. And um, to start with, maybe you're familiar with common snook and you've been out and uh, gone fishing for them even, or maybe you've never seen one or been in areas where they are typically around. But common snook are a medium-sized predatory game species that are heavily reliant on estuaries for parts of their life cycle. So these fish are very highly sought after and targeted by recreational sports fishers and therefore are very economically valuable. They, um, the targeting of um, recreational fishermen of this species uh, contributes quite a bit to the um, fisheries recreation economy down in South Florida and the Caribbean. Uh, it's a unique opportunity to catch a unique fish and people pay good money to do that. So, but historically, um, thinking about this, where this range normally existed, historically they were only found year round um, where the northernmost site was Tampa Bay, essentially, um, Tarpon Springs kind of area. And then frowns through the Caribbean south to Brazil, 
<clears throat> but really outside of that range, <clears throat> sorry, they um, were only found infrequently um, during like more uh, warmer weather times. But in the last 10 years, both the juveniles and adults have been found substantially in greater numbers at higher latitudes and especially in our area. And the reason that there's such a uh, latitudinal um, range restriction of this species is because there is a lower temperature threshold where the fish begin to exhibit um, severe cold stress symptoms such as equilibrium loss and reflex impairment at around 12 degrees Celsius, which is approximately 54 degrees Fahrenheit. And although that temperature may not lead directly to mortality of the fish, um, it can cause conditions to where the fish become um, easily picked up by predators or they you know, wash up on shore, the tide goes out, they're stranded and that's it. But um, at around 10 degrees Celsius, which is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, um, these fish will die. So that is the lowest level of uh, cold that these fish can handle, nothing around 10 or lower. And uh, so in fact, down in South Florida in Tampa Bay, area in South, they, um, in 2010, they experienced a massive cold kill when water temperatures dipped into the 40 degrees um, Fahrenheit over the course of a few days. And that event killed tens of thousands of snook in South Florida, um, Gulf Coast estuaries, and it actually required a closure of the entire fisheries uh, to help rebuild those populations. So the question is, if these fish are so easily harmed by winter temperatures, then how are they able to expand their ranges northward so that they're now in our backyard uh, when they've never been able to live here year round before? Uh, basically, why here and why now? Well, we've, um, we know that even though we can still get some nasty winter temperatures on occasion, overall, the average winter water temperatures have gotten warmer due to climate change. In fact, uh, previous research by my collaborators, uh, Caleb Hurtaball from FWC, Charlie M Martin, a former NCBS faculty member, now at the University of South Alabama, and Mike Allen, uh, our director at NCBS, um, they put out this paper that where they discovered that um, range expansion um, was figured out a few years ago, um, where they found that our uh, the current northern limit of snook in our area reaches up to um, the Suwannee Sound, a little bit north of that, whereas the historical range limit was about around Tarpon Springs, as I mentioned before. So this paper, this work was essential in getting this whole study started. And um, just using a little data from their figures in their paper, what they pretty much help, helped them determine that this was going on was um, a strong correlation on exp exponential growth in the abundance of snook with, that correlated with warming winter temperatures. So looking at these figures on the left is the fisheries independent monitoring data, um, which is the number of snook caught annually in uh, stain and trawl samples. And that exponential growth right there at the end uh, corresponds with the figure on the right, which seems a bit counterintuitive, but what it represents is the number of days in Cedar Key below 12 degrees Celsius, which is that threshold temperature where snook uh, become disoriented and um, possibly subjected to injury or death. So what this figure shows is that there is a decline in the total number of days of, per year where temperatures are too cold for snook. So what we've determined for both snook and uh, mangroves too, that are also undergoing, uh, currently undergoing a range expansion, um, is that until recently, our winters had too many frigid winter days for either mangrove or snook survival. But I also wanna point out that while the total number of days below 12 degrees Celsius has substantially declined, it's not at zero. So meaning that we need to put in the work to figure out what these snook do to combat these occasional frigid temperatures um, that we still get. Wait. And so to um, help answer the question of where snook go during a cold snap, we had to first answer the question of what areas of um, the Suwannee estuary our fish are using during different times of the year especially during winter, but um, we need to know what their movement patterns are. So um, just to highlight like why understanding this, these movement patterns are so important. So just looking at water temperatures from the Gulf of Mexico in this past winter from November to through January um, at Cedar Key, temperatures dropped below that red line, that critical temperature where that causes death and snook. 
normally that would have caused a huge mortality event in our area is what we would believe because it's definitely below their threshold. But um, just like in previous years, other than a few instances of um, sort of cold shock symptoms that seen by a few fishing guides, a few reports of that, that mass mortality event that we would have expected uh, when those temperatures drop like that, it never happened. And so you may have even seen um, a record of this event just like this past year that occurred. Um, this is an article from the Gainesville uh, Main Street Daily News. Um, locals were very worried about their new favorite sport fish. And um, after that cold snap, they were concerned there was going to be a huge uh, mortality event. But um, they reported, like in this article, everyone was happily surprised to see that there were a few casualties outside of uh, one small area south of Suwannee. But other than that, um, there didn't really seem to be very many casualties. And so observations like this and others um, kind of raise the question of why our snook don't seem to be as much in danger of the cold like they have been in the further south and in previous events. And it also hints at the possibility that our snook uh, could have found areas that protect them from cold shock or death and when those temperatures become very dangerous. And that sort of hypothetical place that um, we believe could, um, they may have found, we refer to that as a thermal refuge. So, um, you know, when going about trying to figure out uh, where the fish are, where they're going, where they're moving, um, how they're behaving, you so you, you kind of need to go, um, you kind of need to figure out three basic overarching factors um, for consideration to kind of help you narrow down your search of where you can find your fish. So first of those is that biological factor. So that's basically the evolutionary components that allow your fish to survive under certain conditions. Um, so for example, say you want to go um, look for largemouth bass, like you're not going to take a boat, you know, 10 miles offshore and go try to find them there because you know, as you know, their biological limitations are that they can't survive salt water. So you know that they're going to be in the river or a lake and something like that. So same concept. Um, you just need to know the ins and outs of your fish's biology to help you narrow down the potential locations of habitat preference. And so for snook particularly, we do know that they have a very wide salinity tolerance, so they can move from full offshore seawater um, up into freshwater rivers without a problem. They're also fairly coastal, so they're typically found either close to shore or around shallow flats areas, and also around islands like the Cedar Keys. Um, for you know diet, they know we know that they're carnivorous, but they're very general generalist, so they don't really have a picky diet, so they don't have to you know, track down certain prey items or anything. Um, but most importantly, we know that they're very cold limited. So um, if a cold snap happens, we know that they will have to go to warmer wa waters to survive. So in addition to that biological factor, um, so there's also the behavioral factor to consider. Um, and that dictates things like hunting strategy. So do they move around a lot to hunt their prey or are they opportunists and they just sit around and wait for the food to come to them? Um, there's other things like schooling behavior, for example, where, um, you know, are they actually schooling up? Do they like to get in, congregate in big groups or are they very territorial and have certain areas that they um, move around in um, and separately? Um, but what we know specifically about snook is that not only um, are they generalist carnivores, but they're um, more ambush predators. They're, they're not really like moving around a whole lot to try to track down food they kind of just like to sit in an area with that has structure like bridge or like sunken tree trunks and they'll just kind of wait around for the food to come to them. And then they have these big mouths that they just snap open and it creates like a vacuum forest that pulls in whatever, you know, little prey item, anything that they can swallow, it'll pull in and so that they don't even need teeth, basically. They just kind of sit and wait and just vacuum it up. And um, that's kind of their, their motive. But um, thinking about like, what times of day they're active or something like that. We know that they're pretty um, active. They can be active during the day, but their most activity occurs at night and around sunrise and sunset. And so all of these factors um, contribute to the overall behavioral factor um, to consider when looking for these habitats. But finally, there's the environmental factor. And that combines all the components like depth uh, of the water, the velocity of currents um, in the area, salinity, turbidity, um, oxygen content of the water, submerged structure, um, all those things that combine um, to create the physical parameters of what 
a potential habitat could be for your fish. And so um, using these three factors, we uh, try to find those special places that make snook so flippin' happy that we can officially call it essential snook habitat. And uh, so to find those habitats, um, we use those factors to kind of narrow down our search areas to certain regions where we believe they're most likely to be. And then we use a technique called acoustic telemetry to then track their movements all throughout the Suwannee Sound and other regions. And acoustic telemetry uses uh, devices that emit a pinging sound on a specific wavelength. Um, and then that can be detected with a series of submerged listening devices called receivers. But the first step in um, that process requires us getting out and collecting snook of various sizes and ages. So um, we, to do that, we use help from um, FWC's Fisheries Independent Monitoring Program. Um, so they collect fish uh, with seines, and then we can um, tag and release them live. And then we also, in the more freshwater areas, we can use um, electrofishing. So we go out with electrofishing and then, again, allows us to bring them onto the boats live. We can put the tags in uh, and release them. So then what we do for the tags is we do surgically implant them. So that requires an incision, um, implanting the acoustic tag inside, and then um, sutures to close the wound and then release live. And we have done that um, about 170 times. So we have around 170 tags in Snook currently um, that we've been put in since around 2016. But um, getting tags in the fish is only half the battle. So we also need listening stations in the river and in the estuary to pick up the acoustic signals that are coming from those tags. And what happens is the tags inside a fish will ping every couple minutes and that um, the acoustic receivers that detect um, that sound will um, log the identifying data of that individual fish with a timestamp. So we know which fish it is and we know where the location, which is where the receiver is, and we also know what time. And it gives us an idea of um, when you have like a huge array of receivers, you can pick up, you know, fish on different receivers at different timestamps. It tells you like what their overall movement patterns are. And so, but you, what you really need is a lot of receivers basically at that point. And so to make sure we have enough receivers in places um, to cover the areas we think they might go, we have to partner with other agencies like uh, USGS and FWC that already have receivers out. Um, and then we go in and add our own receivers to kind of help fill in the gaps. And we all contribute to sharing data with each other in what is one of those very rare instances of interagencies coming together and efficiently and effectively providing data to one another in a friendly manner. And it does happen, I promise. And um, so then uh, using all that data, what we found over the past few years is that um, there is a seasonal pattern of uh, snook movement. And what we found is that during the warmer months, spring, summer, fall, um, our snook usually generally hang around out around the Cedar Keys and move around a little bit, um, a little bit further offshore during those months. But as soon as the air temperatures begin to drop around the end of October, they sort of do this mass migration towards the Suwannee River. And so this figure on the right shows you sort of what's what's happening here is that on that date, all of those fish are piled up at the mouth of the Suwannee River. They're getting ready to enter the, the river for the winter. And would you know um, that movement patterns of snook into the rivers in late fall is a standard pattern for snook in South Florida. Uh, they do the same thing down there. And it's believed that they move into the rivers because the um, temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico, the um, saltwater temperatures drop much faster and are far less stable than river temperatures. So they tend to use um, river as like a, a secure area where temperatures aren't gonna drop as low as quickly as it does in the Gulf. And so this seasonal movement pattern is especially important for snook in the Suwannee estuary region, because despite that overall trend of uh, warming average winter temperatures, the minimum Gulf temperatures in this area still do dip down um, to those cold shock levels. And because of this and our findings with these large scale movement patterns into the river during the winter, we hypothesize that they are using sections of the Suwannee for a thermal refuge. But our story doesn't end there because um, upon doing some active searching for snook uh, to figure out which habitats within the Suwannee they are using, um, we wanted to 
um, kind of narrow down which habitats they're um, staying in to, for thermal refuge. And on that search, we found that a lot of snook were actually congregating around the two large springs in the lower Suwannee, which are Manatee and Fanning Springs. And so we hypothesized then that our fish were using um, the springs kind of in a similar manner to the way manatees use the springs, as in they like, you know, famously, we all know that they congregate Manatees will go into springs in the winter and congregate in there um, to stay in that near constant warm water spring temperature. And, and, you know, because the springs are a thermal refuge for them because they are also cold intolerant like snook. And the Suwannee River is so important to this um, fact because aquifer fed springs are a common occurrence on um, in this part of Florida. But the Suwannee River actually has the highest concentration of springs in the United States. Uh, which makes this river potentially a substantial contributor to thermal habitats for overwintering snook if they are in fact using these areas as thermal refuge. And so which is what we needed to confirm. We do need to confirm that they were actually using these spring habitats and um, that they do rely on these areas to survive frigid temperatures in the Suwannee. And so here I have sort of uh, made a graphic depicting some real-time fish locations during a specific cold snap period. Um, this was at Fanning Springs. And so that lava-ish looking little line represents um, that warm water column coming out of the spring, um, out of Fanning and out of Little Fanning and um, going out into the river. And so uh, what you see is that main spring run and then the mouth, and then you see where the spring water flows into the river before it disappears. And um, what we found that is that during these cold snaps, um, our tagged fish were all huddled up within these little warm plume areas. And we know where these plumes, a relative idea of where these plumes are by going out and actually collecting temperature data. And um, so on this date, we did see that our fish were kind of hiding out in these little plume areas to get out of that cold 12.5 degrees Celsius river water. And so, and this is another figure that kind of shows you again, like we did the same thing with Manatee Spring and the very similar um, thing happened there. The fish were all kind of huddled up in this little spring plume area. And what this figure is, um, it sort of just consolidates our tag data over a cold snap period. And this is around Manatee Spring. And it just shows the areas that are most used by our snook during a cold snap. And you can see they really do stay in these sort of these spring plume regions and don't venture out very far at all. Um, but we do need still need to confirm it that they are actually using it because of the temperatures and not just because it's a cool spot to hang out. So um, to confirm this um, idea, we um, used acoustic tags that measure internal body temperatures of the snook. Um, these tags are about twice as expensive as normal tags that don't measure temperature. So we have a quite a bit fewer of those than we do uh, our regular tags, but they are useful because um, snooks are ectotherms, so they can't maintain their own body heat. And so what the internal temperature tells us is basically what the temperature of the surrounding water column is. And so... Um, those temperature tags also have the important purpose of helping us identify a range of temperatures that snook are using during cold snaps. Uh, we can use that information combined with other snook habitat preference factors like depth and structure. And uh, that will all be used to help us determine what that um, essential thermal refuge habitat looks like. And um, we also need to know what conditions are required to make that habitat and to keep it existing. And that's because the plume structure in, um, that comes from the outflow of the spring water is not stable in the least. Um, it's subjected to a wide variety of physical um, environmental factors that um, sort of help develop it and um, dictate what temperatures exist where. Um, so, uh, you know, as that spring water comes out and starts mixing with much colder river water, um, all those physical factors come into play, that warm water becomes diluted and that um, causes the size and the depth um, in, in the river of that warm water plume to expand or contract um, just based on different uh, various physical conditions. Um, these conditions can come in the form of like a river flow, like how fast the river is flowing. Um, is it a flood stage river? Is it a drought river? You know, what are the 
the, what's the springs flow doing? You know, how much water is coming out of the aquifer at what um, flow rate? And then just the differences in temperature between the river and the springs can have a huge factor too. Um, so for example, you know, we have an idea on this one specific snapshot day of what this uh, plume structure looks like. But on the next day, if the river height doubles and, uh, you know, spring uh, decrease, decreases, you, you're going to have extremely wildly different um, plume structures. So it's constantly changing. And so um, we, we need to know how these plume structures are changing. We need to know what's driving the changes in those plume structures. So that's part of um, the uh, research investigation that we're also getting into. Because we want to know, you know, is there a chance that um, conditions get to a point where the plume disappears entirely and it removes all thermal refuge potential? And that's one of our driving questions as well. But um, so this uh, this figure shows is a compilation of our temperature tag data for um, during a cold snap period. Uh, from this past season. And I just put it here because I want to show that it basically um, further confirms that assumption that these fish are preferentially seeking out areas with warmer water that's warmer than the ambient river temperature. And so this figure is color coded for the range of um, the internal tag temperatures relative to the river water temperatures. So um, Dots that are red and orange are around three to six degrees Celsius warmer than the baseline river temperature. Um, and so basically what this does is help us confirm that this thermal refuge concept that these fish are using these areas as thermal refuge. And uh, but basically our work is just getting started because everything I've discussed leading up to this point um, has described all of the full construction of all these little building blocks of research over the last eight years that have led into our uh, next winter season of data collection, which starts um, this month, the last week of October, usually around Halloween is about when fish start um, schooling up and moving into the river. It could be, they could be there already because we have had a little bit of a cold snap recently, which probably has brought down Gulf water temperatures and might've caused them to move up a little bit, but we won't know till I get out there. But um, overall, our end goal is to use all of these um, temperature data points and the habitat per preferences that all that data we're collecting is to help us get a relative understanding of those three factors that I mentioned earlier. So that behavioral, biological, and environmental factors that are influencing uh, where these fish are preferentially um, going to thermal refuge habitat. We, we're trying to find that essential snook habitat basically inside the river. Um, but to get at that understanding, as I said, we need more data. Um, a big reason for that is that it's the amount of time we have to collect, you know, our winters are very short and these little cold snaps, these dangerous cold snaps are even shorter. So um, they, they're just very rare and it doesn't typically last more than a day or two. So it, it takes a few winters to basically cover um, the ground for all the different types of conditions we really need for a good robust analysis. And to help with that, I use this little device. Um, this is a, a conductivity, temperature, and depth profiler. And so what I do is I take that out to the river and go around the springs and drop it in. And it tells me um, from surface to bottom, uh, temperature and conductivity, which can be converted to understand salinity, but um, basically it tells me the temperature profiles at all of the areas around that, is that thermal refuge habitat that we're investigating. Um, and then we also collect data with our um, acoustic receiver arrays. And so what these do is each one of these little push pins on the map is a different receiver and it sort of triangulates um, the detection so that we can use that to pinpoint with pretty high resolution of uh, where exactly where these snook are at all times. So we can just track their full movement inside and outside of the plume how much time they're spending in the plume and things of that. And that really goes a long way to help us understand what's causing these fish to go into these areas and what areas they're using. So um, in addition to that, we um, plan to take all that data and eventually combine it into this, um, to build this sort of conceptual model of the primary factors that are influencing that essential thermal habitat. So once we narrow it down to the meaningful factors, we will um, 
build a statistical model to try to essentially tell us what are the relative contributions of each factor into our um, final results, which is um, the thermal refuge plume quality and quantity. And um, so here I just wanted to re reiterate um, the importance of this work that we're doing um, by reminding us that just because our freezes and cold snaps are rare um, and, you know, it's only 62 degrees outside and I feel like I'm freezing, but uh, that's, you know, Florida for you. So they are rare, but they do occur. And um, without that thermal refuge in place, our uh, novel native snook population could definitely be in jeopardy. Um, and nobody wants to see these kinds of heartbreaking photos full of, with boats full of cold kill snook, like this one that was taken in um, Tampa Bay in 2010. But if it can happen there, it can definitely happen here. I mean, our winters are colder than in South Florida still, and uh, we do still get these cold snap temperatures. And instead we're aiming for those five-star reviews. We want that top quality, uh, essential snook habitat um, in the rivers to make sure that they're going to thrive for um, as long as they can. So finally, um, in conclusion, uh, what is all this for? Like what, what, how does this gonna help um, build and protect that essential uh, fish habitat? But what's gonna happen is we're gonna take all of our findings. Uh, they are, it's all gonna go to the Suwannee River Water Management District. And uh, what they will do is they take this data and these concepts and ideas, and um, it's gonna help them determine um, minimum flows and levels of the exceptionally numerous springs that feed into Suwannee River. Um, so the use of, you know, it's so helpful to have like an indicator species to help them um, achieve these goals, these minimum flows and levels goals. Um, because when you have an indicator species that people really care about, like snook and manatees and things like that, um, when you say that they require this habitat to survive, it helps them make the decisions of how much, you know, putting limits on things like aquifer extraction and those sorts of things. So it's just, it can be a really useful tool for these water management agencies to kind of say that, you know, we need to be more careful about how much aquifer um, levels are changing and or other sorts of things that, you know, uh, could also go into effect the quality and quantity of thermal refuge for these species. And so basically the, our final end goal is to continue building the Sewanee Snook Kingdom and make sure this area can support such a unique novel native species. And hopefully they'll be here for generations to come. And uh, yeah, I just wanna say thank you all for attending. Thanks so much for listening to my talk. Um, yeah, toss this uh, photo up here just to remind everybody that like, yeah, it's it does get really cold out there on the Suwannee and these fish truly are facing some pretty adverse conditions during the winter. So they're, they're survivors. Um, yeah, and with that, I'll, I guess I'll end my slideshow and take any questions anybody may have. Awesome, thank you so much, Ashley. Um, so you do have one question in the Q and A uh, and if you would just read it out loud for the um, recording, since that part sure. won't be captured before you answer it. All right. Uh, where is in the chat? Yeah, it's in the Q&A. I can read it to you. It's It says- Oh, I see, I see. Okay. Yeah. I got it. Um, okay. Are there any demographic anomalies associated with this behavior? Uh, like is the A structure of the Sewanee fish similar to that of more Southern populations? And that is ongoing research, honestly. Um, we don't believe that there's any differences, but there could be differences in things like um, age at growth or growth at age, um, size at age, small differences in um, morphological features um, that we don't, we're not really sure like a hundred percent yet, but we have grad students actually at the University of Florida um, working on that right now, actually. So we'll see. All right. Well, everyone might be working on the poll right now, but please feel free to put any questions you have into the Q&A function. And in the meantime, I'll ask one. So in the kind of early on in the talk, you showed pictures with the 
all the red dots stacking up near East Pass and the Swanee. But there was also like a collection of red dots down there still hanging out in Cedar Keys. So is there, do you guys think there's like a spring vent like seep there or are those just snook that aren't with the program yet? Yeah, we think they're just stragglers basically. <laughs> so hopefully they eventually made their way up there and we didn't just lose tags to, you know, like some cold shock snook or something. But yeah, not all of them are on board with the process entirely. So, and that's just, you know, evolution, right? <laughs> yeah, the, the Darwin <laughs> Award winners. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we're not sure. All right. You have another couple ones coming in on the Q&A and I see Jason's on camera there, so. Is this all right or would you rather have oh, the Q&A no. route? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. How are you, Ashley? I enjoyed your talk. <laughs> I'm great. Thank you. Um, so this might, question might not make a difference as far as the management and things like that. But do you think that we could be seeing a little bit of an adaptation all, as, a, as opposed to just, as you, you asked, like, why now? And obviously the potential for uh, climate change is, it could, could be doing this. Could we see an adaptation? You're on that cutting edge of, as they expand. <laughs> Um, could some of the cold snaps that have caused kills selected for fish that could potentially be a couple degrees more tolerant than, say, the fish that are further south and aren't having to deal with that? Yeah, that's a great question and a relevant question because uh, there's somebody actually working on that right now and doing some cold trials. Um, and there have been a few cold trials. It's still ba basically being worked out, um, but to kind of give you a rough and ready answer for that we we don't believe so we don't believe that they are any more tolerant to cold temperatures than the southern population um we do still get those um the fish that are affected by that 12 degree range the um, cold shock we do still get those um fish in this area um so we believe that their tolerance is just that they have found areas to kind of get out of the cold when it does get um, too cold, but that's, yeah, it's, I could be wrong. That could change with more data, but um, up to this point, we, we think that they're the same, have the same physiological tolerances to cold that yeah. the Southern ones do as well. Yeah. I'm just curious. Cause they, you kind of used um, manatees as the comparison, right? They're kind of mm -hmm. mimicking that, but manatees have been coming up here for, uh, for quite a while also. And yeah. so, the, the question of why now is just is an interesting one. So appreciate it's that. It's very, yeah, definitely. Like the springs have been here. Manatees have known about springs, you know, for hundreds, hundreds of thousands of years, whatever. And, you know, why haven't the snook made that discovery yet too? And we don't have an answer for that at all. So this is just kind of a new, like, maybe they just didn't have, weren't able to spend enough time, like as water temperatures began to drop. Maybe they didn't have enough time basically before they were killed by the cold to find those springs. But and, and that that was my question is is maybe maybe they've just kind of selected for fish that again aren't cold tolerant, but just maybe mm -hmm. a little bit more cold tolerant. Or yeah. their their barometer's a little more keyed in on, oh, it's about to get cold. We better move sooner. But anyway. Yeah. It, yeah, it's possible. It's definitely a possibility. I wouldn't rule it out. But yeah, we'll see. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Sure, thanks. All right, let me answer some Q&As. Yes, you have two typed ones and then Mike has his hand up too. Okay, so there's one question from Jim Cato. Has any similar research been conducted for Crystal River? Yes, ongoing research right now. I have also helped out with that, but that's primarily um, FWC, um, the uh, their research lab, their group. They have a Snook group and um, they're essentially doing these, answering the same, asking the same questions about Crystal River. And there is a very large population of Snook in Crystal River now. And um, so next question, Jim Estes, any info on potential offshore thermal vents? It does not make sense that all the Snook in the area use the major river springs. Um, so we do not have any info on offshore thermal vents yet. That is a one of those kind of pipe dream sort of research questions we have that we would love to do more um, research to go to some of those thermal vent areas. Haven't been able to um, get the funding to help answer that question yet, but hopefully we'll be able to find something to sort of do some more investigation 
in those really unique habitats where the spring uh, aquifer water is coming up in offshore. So that would be a great question to answer. And I would love to continue doing work into that question for sure. And then finally, I have an on anonymous. Um, are you noticing any other species that are also following this northward migration into warmer waters? And that is a great question. Um, and I would imagine that, yes, that that is happening. What species other than outside of um, mangroves and snook, I can't certainly really say myself for certain, but things like um, parrotfish um, are coming up from Caribbean waters, spending more time up here. Whether or not they're staying here year round, um, I think maybe one species does, but other than that, I'm not really sure. Um, otherwise, yeah, we're probably, you know, we're at the cusp of that range limit for a lot of cold and tolerant tropical species. Um, and as things continue to get a little bit warmer, I expect we'll be seeing a lot more um, sort of more tropical species moving into our area. So it has a lot of interesting implications for the Suwannee River region, for sure. And I think Mike Allen has his mic. You got your hand up. Do you have a question? Yeah, I was just going to add a little bit. Great job, Ashley. I was just going to add a, a couple of things on the on the cold tolerance um, question that, that Jason brought up. Um, so Brittany Scharf is a PhD student down at the Tropical Aquaculture Lab in Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences, and she's the one that was doing those trials um, for cold tolerance using snook from our area and then snook from further south, including the Everglades. I haven't seen her... Um, her latest results, but her initial results showed a very slight difference in the temperature tolerance for the fish up here. I don't know whether it would be enough biologically um, to make a difference, but so seeing the rest of her results will be really interesting. We, we did show through a master's student that the um, genetic composition of the snook up here is different than the ones further south in the Gulf but we haven't yet linked that to a cold tolerance um, change. So it, it's a it's a really good question, Jason. And then I also just wanted to mention as far as Crystal River is that the Southwest Florida Water Management District's doing the exact same thing um, with FWC and with us uh, looking at um, using snook as, a, as an indicator for minimum flows and levels in Crystal River, um, as well as uh, Homosassa as well. So just a couple of additions. So thank you. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. And I guess Mark. Hey, Mark. Do you have a question? Hey, Ashley. Great talk. Hey, Mark. Um, really interested in this stuff. Um, I had a, yeah, I had a question. Uh, if you know if they have uh, some, if the snook prey on different things when they're moving into the different habitats, uh, and uh, and if, you know how would we how would we figure that out? So that's my, a side project that I've abandoned like three times. <laughs> so I've actually gone out and um, attempted to do some lavaging and stuff. Um, and we, I don't know, I do not have an answer to that question yet. I would imagine it's another, it's, it's all interesting because, you know, you think about like their body temperature in the spring versus their body temperature in the river and their metabolism because of that body temperature so they're probably going to eat, need to eat more while they're in the spring. There's, a, I can that keep going. Be my, like, that would be my next question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, everything you, yeah. you find sort of just opens the door onto at least five more questions that avenues of research we could go down. So, but yeah, maybe we can look into it. When you, when yeah, right. I got to imagine that they're, they're sort of, yeah. I mean, even if it's just like uh, uh, isotope stuff, it's got to look really different right. um, yeah. when they're, when they're in, that, in that time. I mean, that's definitely what we saw with the uh, alligators um, back mm -hmm. uh, when I was an undergrad, um, you know, that they're, when they were in like more fresh areas, they're in like bugs, you know, little bit like yeah. frogs, tadpoles, that sort yeah. of thing. And then they go out on the salt marsh, you know, eating saltwater things, obviously. I wonder if, yeah, there's gotta be some yeah. sort of uh, pretty interesting diet shift. And if they're eating a ton more, that's really, yeah, that's pretty cool. You would the, expect um, them to, right? The coolest thing I found in like the few lavages that I was able to do was, um, exoskeleton of a or a carapace of a um crawfish yeah the, wow so like cool. i mean they're just getting anything you know anything Definitely. they can get so it's it's a really cool question um nice. but yeah thanks for that cool and all right i think that's it I think that's all my questions
Yeah, and just a comment from Mike that there is a, another student that's also working on isotope and diet stuff. So there will be more data, more data to come. Stay tuned. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. And I'll be sending a follow up email with a link to the recording and a reminder about our next upcoming program. So thanks so much, Ashley. Um, that was great. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me.